And I call on Michael Matheson to speak to and to move the motion. Thank you, President Officer. President Officer, everyone in this chamber is aware that domestic abuse blights the lives of too many people in Scotland. It might not be obvious because it is largely hidden, often occurring behind closed doors and out of sight. But we know that it is widespread. The number of incidents are truly shocking. It's likely that everyone in this chamber, even if they don't know it, is likely to have family or friends who have been abused or are being abused by a partner or an ex-partner. In 2015-16, nearly 60,000 domestic abuse incidents were reported to the police. And that is likely to be a significant underestimate of the true extent of domestic abuse. In 2014-15, the Scottish Crime and Justice Survey found that only a fifth of those who experienced partner abuse in the previous 12 months said that the police knew about the most recent incident. And 14% of adults have experienced partner abuse since the age of 16. Sign so, officer, anyone can be a victim of domestic abuse. And it is most def definitely not restricted to one gender, one class, or urban or rural area in the country. However, we know that women are disproportionately likely to be victims of domestic abuse. Twice as many women report having experienced partner abuse in the previous 12 months as men. And the instance of female victim and male perpetrator represented nearly 80% of all incidents of domestic abuse recorded by the police in 2015-16. Prime Officer, we as a parliament and as a society have moved a long way in our understanding of domestic abuse since the Scottish Parliament was established in 1999. I was a founding member of the Justice and Home Affairs Committee in this parliament. I well remember key stakeholder groups such as Scottish Women's Aid coming to that committee seeking to explain why steps were needed to tackle domestic abuse. Back then, it was sadly the case that too many in our society saw domestic abuse solely in terms of physical violence. And crucially, there was also an attitude within some parts of society that it was a private matter and no business of the police or anyone else. Time has moved on and attitudes have thankfully evolved. Our modern understanding of domestic abuse shaped by the experience of women affected and the groups that help them is now such that we know domestic abuse is commonly experienced as a pattern of abusive behaviour that is sustained over time. It can take the form of physical violence or even overt threats, but it can also take the form where an abuser may behave in a highly controlling, coercive and abusive way over a long period of time. The Domestic Abuse Scotland Bill is this government's and this Parliament's next important step in the fight to address the scourge that is domestic abuse. Mr. Officer, this Parliament has already taken action to reform the criminal law concerning domestic abuse. In 2010, this Government ensured that what might be described as the traditionally understood form of domestic abuse, prosecuted using common law breach of the peace, could continue to be prosecuted using a new statutory offence of threatening and abusive behaviour. This followed a court judgment which called into question the scope of the offence of breach of the peace. This parliament has also legislated to create an offence of stalking, which can on occasion be relevant in cases of domestic abuse. However, notwithstanding these reforms, it's clear that the criminal law does not 
fully reflect what domestic abuse is in all its forms as our modern understanding reveals. As many of you will know, the then Solicitor General, Leslie Thompson QC, called on the Scottish Parliament to consider the creation of a specific offence of domestic abuse in 2014. She said that in her experience of prosecuting domestic abuse, the existing criminal law did not always reflect the experience of victims of long-term domestic abuse. The explanation given was because the law focuses on individual instances of, for example, threatening behaviour or assault and does not reflect the fact that domestic abuse is commonly experienced as a pattern of abusive behaviour that is sustained over time. The kinds of cases which stakeholders have highlighted as being difficult to prosecute using the existing law are those in which an abuser behaves in a highly controlling, manipulative and abusive way towards their partner over a long period of time. Examples of what abusers may do to humiliate their partners are horrendous. Forcing someone to eat food off the floor, controlling access to the toilet, or repeatedly putting them down or telling them that they are worthless. Abusers can also try to control every aspect of their partner's life. For example, preventing them from attending work or college, stopping them making contact with their family and friends, giving them no or limited access to money, checking or controlling their use of their phone or social media. These actions can often not be accompanied by physical violence or overt threats because the abuser knows that the victim may be in so much fear of their partner that they do not need to take physical or threatening action to exert control. This behaviour can be very difficult to prosecute under our existing law. And even where a prosecution is possible, a conviction, for example, for an, an incident of threatening or abusive behaviour may leave the victim feeling that the court process and the sentence imposed did not reflect the reality of the abuse they experienced. So, and also, the centrepiece of this bill is a new offence of domestic abuse. This new offence modernises the criminal law to reflect our understanding of what domestic abuse is by providing for a specific offence that is intended to be as comprehensive so that abuse in its totality can be prosecuted as a single offence. It is a course of conduct offence which enables the entirety of the perpetrator's abusive behaviour to be included in a single charge. This allows the court to consider the totality of the abuse that is alleged to have taken place. It enables the court to consider both behaviour which would be criminal under the existing law, like assault and threats, and psychological abuse and coercive and controlling behaviour which can be difficult to prosecute under our existing law. Crucially, of course, I'll give way to the member. Liam MacArthur. Very grateful to the Government Secretary for taking intervention and indeed for the way he's set out um, the, the, the proposition uh, under scrutiny at the moment. He'll be aware that the committee heard evidence about the, the potential for setting the evidential bar uh, too low in terms of pr prosecuting criminal offences. I think the Scottish Government's response to the committee's report is very helpful in setting out why that isn't the case. But I wonder whether you might be able to read that onto the record uh, for the benefit of the Parliament now. Cabinet Secretary. I will seek to do so, uh, 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 President Officer, and I think uh, in our response to the uh, committee's report, we believe that we have set the bar right. It also reinforces the oral evidence which I gave to the committee at the time uh, when it was considering uh, the stage, uh, stage one report, that we believe that the uh, bar which we have set with the uh, qualifying criteria for engaging this offence is the right level, uh, and we believe that the courts will interpret it in an appropriate way. Officer, can I say that, crucially, the way this offence is uh, going to work is to both criminalise certain specific behaviour, such as violent behaviour, and also criminalise other types of behaviour by reference to the effect it has on the partner 
or ex-partner. So, for example, the offence seeks to cover behaviour such as unreasonably restricting access to money by reference to the fact that this may make the partner feel dependent or subordinate to the perpetrator. So, and also, children too are harmed by domestic abuse. When a parent is being abused, this always brings harm to the child, whether directly from the child witnessing the abuse or indirectly where a child is affected by the effect it has on their parent. In line with the long established definition of domestic abuse, this bill is about creating a new offence of domestic abuse between partners and OREX partners. And the harm to children is acknowledged through the new statutory aggravation. So where children are involved, this can be reflected by the court when sentencing the perpetrator. Sign officer, I welcome the Justice Committee Stage 1 report, which supports the general principles of this bill. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank those organisations, and in particular, those individuals, not least those who shared with the committee their personal experience of suffering domestic abuse, who gave evidence to the committee to assist their consideration of the bill. The committee have raised a number of important issues, including how we might expand the scope of the power to impose non-harassment orders to provide protection to the children of the victim. The proposal to create emergency banning orders, which would ban a perpetrator from a victim's home. And issues concerning the interaction between the criminal domestic abuse cases and the civil child contact case process. The Scottish Government has responded to the stage one report recommendations, and I will of course listen carefully to the views offered on those issues in today's debate ahead of stage two of the bill. And on the specific issues of non-harassment orders, I'll give way to the member. Thank you for giving way and I welcome uh, his thanks to all those groups who have contributed to this process. Scottish Women's Aid and indeed Children First have both called for a parallel offence specifically around domestic abuse and the impact it has on children to be included on the face of the bill. I wonder if you could tell just now whether his mind is still open to that at this stage. And if the Cabinet Minister could do so and conclude, uh, bring his remarks to a conclusion. Thanks. Then, uh, we've, we have responded to that particular issue, the case, at the stage of stage one, when it was being considered by the committee, and we've set out the approach we're going to take is through reform of child welfare legislation, which will allow us to look at creating a specific measure to tackle issues around domestic abuse for children, because that would be a more appropriate avenue in order to consider that specific issue. And part of the reason for that is that the qualifying criteria that's set out in this bill for adults is actually one which would be very difficult to apply in the instance of children. And that's why taking a different approach to how we deal with children in this matter will be extremely important to make sure that this approach works, but also that we get a specific approach that will also work for children in the future. So, and also, in conclusion, creating a, a new offence of domestic abuse will not, on its own, end domestic abuse. However, it is a groundbreaking approach that will put Scotland at the forefront of efforts to tackle the scourge of psychological abuse and coercive control. The new offence will provide greater clarity for victims, sending a clear signal that what their partners, what their partners do to them is not only wrong, but is criminal. Improve the ability of the police and our prosecutors to intervene in specific cases and change societal attitudes about what domestic abuse is. That it is not only physical violence, but also psychological abuse, exerting total control over a partner's every movement and action, forcing them to live in constant fear. Sign officer, for too long, an attitude has been allowed to linger that domestic abuse is a private matter, no business of the criminal law. This bill makes crystal clear those days are long gone. I move the motion in my name. Thank you. I now call on Margaret Mitchell to open for the committee to be followed by Liam Kerr. Margaret Mitchell. Presiding officer, I'm pleased to be speaking on behalf of the Justice Committee in this important debate. The committee took evidence on the bill over six meetings earlier this year. Private meetings were held with survivors of psychological domestic abuse from different parts of Scotland. And the committee received written evidence from over 40 organisations and individuals. The new domestic abuse offence in the bill 
is intended to address a gap in the law, namely the lack of a criminal remedy when do domestic abuse is primar primarily psychological in nature in a relationship where one party seeks to control and dominate the other. The committee heard that the current law is not well equipped to handle situations where, where abuse consists of a course of behaviour as opposed to an isolated incident. This means the current law does not effectively reflect the lived experience of many victims. The private me meetings that the committee members held with survivors of psychological domestic abuse helped members immensely to better understand the nature of this particular form of domestic abuse and the trauma that it causes. It was indeed sobering to reflect that some of the appalling conduct victims described cannot currently be prosecuted. Consequently, Police Scotland, the Crown Office and many third sector organisations who gave evidence were all of the view that reform is overdue. The committee agrees. However, a minority of witnesses, including legal academics and the Scottish Police Federation, expressed some significant concerns about the new offence. They stated that it was not easy to legislate in terms of human relationships and consequently that there was a risk of inadvertently making bad law. This, they feared, could result in an individual being charged for behaviour that is not by any reasonable standards criminal or being charged when there is no clear evidence that a crime has been committed. The committee therefore considered this evidence very carefully and took into account the counter argument from witnesses who disagreed with this view. For example, Chief Superintendent Leslie Bowles stated that officers were not being called upon to do anything especially new. They already deal with complex abuse and child welfare cases. The counter arguments also recognised that aspects of the new offence, like any new offence, will give rise to questions of interpretation. And here the committee was persuaded by the evidence led about context. This emphasised that an understanding of the context of the behaviour is crucially important. If some, in some contexts, even the most innocuous seeming comment may in fact be a chilling threat. Whilst a new offence addresses abuse between partners, the drafting recognises that perpetrators sometimes use third parties, children in particular, as a means of control. The bill also makes provision for a statutory aggravator for instances of partner abuse in which children are directly involved. This was welcomed, although some considered the bill should have gone further and recognised the abuse of a child as a criminal act in its own right. The committee understands these views, but notes the Scottish Government's response, confirming that the bill was never intended to have this wider focus. Instead, the Government has committed to consult on this issue in the near future. In terms of implementation, the committee recommends that there should be a publicity, a publicity campaign to draw attention to the new law and to underline the psychological abuse in a relationship is totally unacceptable. The committee also considered that the police and prosecutors must set clear policies on how they intend to enforce the new offence. Crucially, these policies must be kept under review in the light of experience. Furthermore, evidence led indicated that the new offence is likely to be relatively resource intensive, especially as the cases can be complex and vulnerable witnesses and victims will almost certainly need support. The committee therefore recommends that the funding of agencies dealing with the new offences must also be kept under review. Some evidence was led to the effect that there was an excessive focus on punishment in handling domestic abuse. However, many others, including Social Work Scotland, strongly disagreed. The committee did observe that punishment for the crime is potentially up to 14 years imprisonment and that it would be possible for this to be imposed on the base of psychological abuse alone if the court considered this merited. The committee has asked the government to expand on its reasons for taking this approach. The remaining reforms in the bill are many 
procedural or evidential changes to the law as it relates to domestic abuse. These reforms are important to ensure that the justice system supports rather than re-traumatises victims of abuse. One such reform is the proposal to require court to consider whether to make an NHO, a non-harassment order, at the end of every domestic abuse criminal case. The committee is supportive of this recommendation, especially as the current law, placing the initiative with the prosecutor, is not resulting in these orders being used when it's appropriate to do so. However, the committee took cognizance of the fact that an NHO does not always offer the victim the protection that was intended and it asked at the government to respond to, to this point. In addition, a case was made by some organisations about the advantages of and the need for so-called emergency barring, barring orders. These orders would exclude an abuser from the victim's home immediately. The committee has therefore agreed to take more evidence on this at stage two. Finally, the issue of decisions made in the civil courts not taking cognizance of convictions in the criminal court was raised, especially in relation to contact with the child of a person who was a victim of domestic abuse. The committee noted uh, this issue. In closing, presiding officer, I want to pay tribute to the courage and eloquence of those victims of abuse who shared their stories with the committee. In so doing, they have without doubt helped underline why this bill has, been, has the potential to improve our justice system. And the committee recommends that the parliament approve the general principles. Thank you. Can I thank Margaret Mitchell as convener of the Justice Committee. I call on Liam Kerr to open for the Conservatives, followed by Claire Baker. Liam Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I echo the Cabinet Secretary and Justice Committee conveners' thanks to everyone who gave evidence to the committee, along with the clerks and Spice for all their assistance. In its current form, criminal law focuses on discrete incidents of physical violence or on threatening behaviour that causes fear or alarm. It can fail to recognise the lived experience of domestic abuse as a course of conduct over a period of time. And therefore, it seeks to bridge the gap making it possible inter alia to convict an individual on the basis of a course of conduct that includes psychological abuse. As the Cabinet Secretary made clear, the bill, if passed, is intended to improve how the justice system responds to domestic abuse by principally creating a new offence of engaging in an abusive course of conduct, even entirely non-physical, against a partner or ex-partner, and will also amend procedural and evidential aspects of criminal law with a view to tipping the balance in favour of domestic abuse victims. Accordingly, I confirm the Scottish Conservatives do support this bill in principle and will vote to agree to the general principles of the Domestic Abuse Scotland Bill at decision time tonight. The proposed bill seeks to address a lacuna in the legislative landscape. The committee heard compelling and persuasive evidence from a number of organisations, social workers, the Equalities and Human Rights Commission, and indeed from abuse survivors themselves. Some of the harrowing conduct described to the committee is not currently criminal and therefore cannot be prosecuted, and it's that which the bill seeks to address. There are some areas which merit further consideration which my colleagues will pick up throughout this debate. Firstly, in summary, concerns have been expressed over whether the bill risks setting the bar of criminality too low, potentially leading to the wrong cases being prosecuted. Callum Steele of the Scottish Police Federation gave evidence that couples at the time of a relationship breakdown may sometimes be, quote, particularly horrible to each other, but that a few months down the line, the parties may regret getting the criminal justice system involved. Andrew Tickell of Glasgow Caledonian University Law School expressed concerns around over-criminalization when the law intervenes in family and romantic life. He had particular concerns around the use of the word distress to define psychological harm, which is a novel term in criminal law. The SPF further expressed disquiet around officers becoming pawns in routine family disagreements. Callum Steele noting there is a fundamental difference between arresting on the basis of physical evidence and interpreting whether there had been psychological abuse. He said at the very least officers would need training to apply the law. And I note the Cabinet Secretary's responses to the committee in that regard. 
and indeed agree with Liam MacArthur's intervention earlier that the Cabinet Secretary's response is useful in a great deal of respects in that regard. Presiding officer, I'd like to flag an area which the Scottish Government might wish to consider. Courts can sometimes seem stacked against domestic abuse survivors. There is an acceptance that the judicial process for domestic abuse victims is traumatic and steps should be taken to minimise what they have to relive and, as the report suggests, ensure they are not re-victimised by the criminal justice process. The Scottish Government accepts this point in their policy memorandum for the Domestic Abuse Bill. The issue potentially persists where victims of domestic abuse have to recount their case to multiple sheriffs. Far too often in cases of domestic abuse there may be a number of issues, for example divorce and or child residence arrangements, as well as the domestic abuse. These will be heard in different arenas, with perhaps one sheriff in a civil court hearing evidence during divorce proceedings and a separate one in the criminal court for the domestic violence. There is also the possibility that multiple sheriffs deal with different stages of a civil case. According to Spice, at present, a number of sheriffs can be involved in an individual family case. There is no system whereby the same sheriff deals with every stage of the civil case. That means potentially victims have to repeatedly relive their ordeal. Domestic violence victims face many barriers to safety and independence. Incomprehensible and or over complex court proceedings should not be won. Now trials of one family, one judge system to address this have been carried out in the US, Australia and New Zealand, where the victim only has to recount their experience to a single judge to avoid unnecessary trauma. And in England there have been trials of an integrated domestic violence court in which one judge handles the criminal cases related to domestic violence, as well as all accompanying civil matters. In this, a single presiding judge is cross-trained to handle all matters, criminal and civil, relating to a family. And by concentrating responsibility, arguably the court speeds decision-making and eliminates the potential for conflicting judicial orders. It can increase coordination amongst criminal justice and community-based social service agencies and may be better able to keep tabs on defendants responding quickly to allegations of non-compliance with imposed orders. So this may reduce the number of court appearances, streamlining the process and meaning that the trauma of retelling the incident numerous times can be avoided. A review found that, and I quote, the evidence on IDVCs is promising and indicates there are advantages to bringing together family, civil and criminal cases. Now I accept there are issues to be addressed, difficulties can arise where the evidence given in one case differs from another and there could be an administrative burden e ensuring the same judge deals with both matters. Proper procedures, administration and resources would require to be in place to make it happen but surely whether as part of this bill or separately a one family, one sheriff approach for domestic abuse victims in Scotland is certainly worth exploring. Presiding officer, domestic abuse is monstrous and can cause immense and enduring trauma and harm. It has been sobering to hear and read the testimony of victims and organisations which support them, highlighting that there is behaviour which cannot currently be prosecuted because it doesn't meet the threshold of criminal conduct. It is clear from that evidence that more must be done to support victims, that there is a gap in our law and this new offence is required. And we agree that the general principles of the Domestic Abuse Scotland Bill are sound and shall vote for that today. However, we are confident that the government will listen to concerns raised in the Justice Committee's report and during the debate today to ensure the new law is as effective as it can be. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I call Claire Baker. Thank you, President Officer. Um, this year, Scottish Women's Aid reached their 40th... Sorry, start again. Last year, Scottish Women's Aid reached their 40th year. Uh, their work from local groups providing support and refuge for women and children who are facing domestic abuse through to their role as a national organisation who give a focus to pushing for political and societal change has been instrumental in shifting attitudes. This includes how the legal system and the police have both changed their response to domestic abuse. The difference in how we deal with domestic abuse today compared to how we dealt with it 40 years ago is clear and welcome. There can no longer be an acceptance that domestic abuse is a private matter, that it is the victim's fault or that the victim could leave if they really wanted to. Yet there is still work to be done and there is a gap in the law as this bill recognises. The reality facing victims throughout Scotland is that abuse within relationships is as much psychological and emotional as it is physical in nature. 
People's homes become their prisons, their actions are watched, they are cut off from their friends and families. They are at the mercy of their abuser, someone who they loved or even still love. That is why we are fully supportive of ensuring that psychological abuse and coercive and controlling behaviour is recognised as a crime. And I would like to say at the outset that we very much support the general principles of the bill. There is much to welcome. However, I hope the Cabinet Secretary appreciates I only have a brief seven minutes in which I would like to use this time constructively to look at where we could possibly strengthen the bill. There are ways in which we can make this bill stronger and these changes are achievable. Domestic abuse has a devastating impact on the victim and we must also recognise that that impact can spread further than the intended victim. Often in families it can have a serious and long-term impact on children. Those who witness domestic abuse are at an increased risk of experiencing mental health problems, of developing alcohol or substance abuse problems, or entering into abusive relationships themselves. We do not want to be in a position in a few years' time where we consider this bill to have been a missed opportunity. Women's Aid and Children First argue that at stage two or three, we can assure the law recognises the damaging impact domestic abuse can have on children. And I appreciate the Cabinet Secretary's response to Kezia Dugdale on this issue this afternoon and his argument that the bill is perhaps not the appropriate place for this. However, I, I think this will be an issue that will be tested at stage two. We need to appreciate the link between domestic abuse cases on victims and any children they may have, especially not exclusively younger children. If physical assault is witnessed, this clearly has a significant impact on children. So if we look at the impact of controlling behaviour where a mother's movements are restricted, their finances and independence is constrained, we cannot ignore the impact on their child who will also suffer from these restrictions. As Women Day highlight in their briefing for today's debate, a woman and children's experiences of domestic abuse are interwoven and inseparable. We must also consider the impact of domestic abuse when it comes to future contact decisions. To inflict domestic abuse onto another person is a choice. And it's vital that this choice is strongly considered in any court decision to award or refuse contact to parents who have been guilty of abusing their partner or their ex. We must move away from the current situation where evidence of domestic abuse does not play a significant part in contact decisions. And the move to insist that courts always consider the use of an NHO is welcome. And I also look forward to the Scottish Government's response to the committee's recommendation of the use of emergency banning orders. There was some evidence to the committee that incidents could be engineered or provoked to prevent child contact, that there'd be a malicious element within them. But there was very little substantive evidence about the extent of this. Rather, there were descriptions of contact orders being used to continue with psychological abuse. I recognise this is an issue that has been recently discussed at the Public Petitions Committee, and the government is reviewing relevant legislation. While out with the scope of this bill, it is important that this bill is consistent with other pieces of legislation in the review that is ongoing. Uh, scrutiny of the detail of the bill will be important and we all want to see an effective bill. But context is also important and that is why we will be uh, committing towards a national rollout of domestic abuse courts. We believe this to be a model that works in ensuring victims feel safe and confident in coming forward, that their case will be taken seriously and it will help in delivering convictions. Sadly, we have seen cases involving domestic abuse in recent years where it has often been difficult to understand the judgment that has been reached. Domestic abuse courts would ensure consistency and expertise and we should encourage models which can build this specialism. The bill then affords us the opportunity to put down in statute such a commitment to this model. By doing so, we would not only show a commitment to victims that we understand the fragile and complex nature of their cases, but we can also address some of the concerns we have heard regarding the scope and the definition of the law. Um, also, training for the judiciary is vital, and I know that this is offered, but a degree of compulsion would be greatly beneficial. Ultimately, we must have confidence that this bill and the subsequent law is clear and easily understood, not just by lawyers and the judiciary, but by those at risk of domestic abuse. The concerns raised to the committee regarding the clarity of the new offence must continue to be addressed. While there is much support for the bill, we should recognise that it will be tested and we must all be confident that it can achieve its objectives. As this bill progresses, the Scottish Government must continue to work in putting forward the case that the law is robust, that it's clear in its objectives and that the new offence will deliver justice for victims. 
While stage two will test the bill, I have a level of confidence in the current legislation and that sections one and two provide a series of thresholds and safeguards. Psychological damage cannot be trivialised. It must be, by its definition, serious or, insubstanti or substantial. And this bill must challenge, not normalise, actions that demean, humiliate, harm and control partners. This bill can only be the latest step in tackling domestic abuse. In Scotland, as the Cabinet Secretary stated in his opening statement, the extent of the abuse is still concerning. We have to ensure that there is sufficient funding for advocacy services, for refuge accommodation, for counselling and one-to-one -one support. Many of these are feeling the strain of funding pressures, particularly in our local authorities. We know that there can be a postcode lottery when it comes to receiving support, especially in rural areas, and we must work to address this. Presiding officer, we will be fully supportive of the general principles tonight and we look forward to contributing to strengthening the bill as it progresses its way through Parliament. Thank you. Thank you. We now move into the open part of the debate and we begin with uh, Mary Goujon to be followed by Maurice Curry. Mary Goujon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It's a privilege to speak in this debate on the Domestic Abuse Bill because it's such a vitally important piece of legislation to come before Parliament. Now, this bill makes domestic abuse a specific offence and creates a new offence of engaging in a course of abusive behaviour towards a partner or ex-partner and recognises for the first time the patterns of abusive behaviour and the truly traumatic and lasting impact that this has on the victims of abuse. The Justice Committee heard a considerable amount of powerful evidence on this bill and I'd like to focus my contribution today on non-harassment orders. A non-harassment order is a court order which can be used against a partner, ex-partner or indeed any third party behaving in a way that frightens or causes distress. And as it currently stands, it is up to the prosecution to request a non-harassment order. They're under no obligation at all to engage with the victim on whether or not an application should even be made. Under the current system, only a small percentage of successfully prosecuted cases actually result in non-harassment orders being issued. We received figures from research done in one particular region that found out of 644 cases with a domestic abuse aggravator, there were convictions in 502 of those cases, yet only 33 non-harassment orders were issued. That's in only 6% of cases. Changes proposed under this bill would instead see consideration of these mandatory in such cases. Now, non-harassment orders are particularly important for two reasons. Firstly, as mentioned repeatedly in the submitted evidence by the Crown Office and Zero Tolerance, amongst others, there is a significantly high risk of reoffending, with Zero Tolerance stating it as a near certainty in domestic abuse cases. And secondly, the high financial cost of pursuing a non-harassment order through the civil courts. In written evidence, we heard from one survivor of domestic abuse who told us about her own experiences. She said, on the day of sentencing, I did not know if my abuser, who was my husband, would be given a non-harassment order. He was not. In effect, the law would allow him to leave court, get in his car and drive straight back to the marital home where I was still living. Having had this be the benefit of 17 months of police bail conditions while he was innocent, the law waits until he is actually convicted of a violent crime, then lifts the protection I had. It just doesn't make sense. She then went on to highlight what this means financially for those who are then forced to try and pursue a non-harassment order through the civil courts. A civil interdict is a very expensive route, and I would argue beyond the reach of most victims. When considering this, I rang a solicitor and was quoted £2,000. When I expressed my shock and asked, what if I can't afford it? He replied that some women just wait to be assaulted again and use bail conditions. Costs can in fact spiral to as high as £10,000 if the interdict is defended and can be considered effectively acting as a barrier to justice. The evidence then went on to say, I can honestly say I would rather be assaulted again than go through the system as it stands. Now what really frustrates me and actually hurts me about that statement is that we heard exactly the same phrase from another victim of domestic abuse when we took evidence uh, as part of the Justice Committee's inquiry into the Crown Office. We simply cannot have a situation that makes people who have suffered at the hands of such horrendous abuse prefer to suffer that, that abuse than go through the justice system. Another important element we touched on during our evidence session was that of the potential for introducing emergency barring orders, which would be an immediate action that can be taken, which would essentially ban perpetrators of abuse from the home of the victim for as long as it's considered necessary. 
Unfortunately, we felt as a committee we didn't take enough evidence on that to in order to make a recommendation, but I'm glad that we will be taking more evidence on that at stage two. And in conclusion, I would just say that this is such an important piece of legislation that we're looking at today, and one that has the capacity to make a huge difference. To those who've suffered physical and psychological abuse, as well as sending a message loud and clear that this insidious crime of domestic abuse will not be tolerated in our society and in our country. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Before I call Morris Corrie, can I just remind everyone it's four minute speeches, but there is some reasonable time in hand to take interventions and you will get your time back. Uh, I call Morris Corrie to be followed by Sandra White. Mr Corrie. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. <clears throat> I am very glad to have the opportunity today to take part in this very important debate about the Domestic Abuse Bill. I would also like to thank and acknowledge the organisations and individuals who gave um, so e eagerly and well the evidence they put before the Justice Committee, sometimes in awfully different, uh, difficult circumstances. Domestic abuse is an intolerable evil act which happens too often in our society. It harms those who are meant to be closest to us and to whom we look to for support. It is totally unacceptable whatever form it comes in, but as it stands, the law doesn't properly take into account every aspect of domestic abuse. As it states on page 12 of the report, where it references a submission by Anne-Marie Hicks of the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service, and I quote, the current law prevented the bigger picture behind an abusive relationship being put before the court. The need to include psychological abuse, uh, as with physical abuse, was clearly highlighted by SACRO as well in their submission to the committee. They are correct when they highlight that psychological abuse can just be as effective as a method of control as physical abuse. The need for changes has also been made clear to the Justice Committee from a large number of varied and respected uh, external sources, also from organisations which work with victims of domestic abuse, social workers, academics, lawyers, the police service, the Crown Office and the Procurator Fiscal Service. That is not to say there aren't issues with the bill though. For example, Claire Connolly of the Faculty of Advocates noted concerns that the offences as set out in the bill doesn't sufficiently contextualise the conduct to be made criminal as has been spoken about by my colleague Liam Kerr. Additionally, she noted that whilst passing the bill, it would be appropriate that a publicity campaign focusing on addressing coercive control be placed alongside the passing of the bill. I agree with her conclusion that this will probably be an overall more effective approach alongside the bill. So I would be interested to hear from the Scottish Government as to what thoughts they have given to the possibility of a publicity campaign to highlight the issues of coercive control as it relates to domestic abuse. Research does bear this out as being a problem area. It shows that many people are likely to think what forms of coercive controlling behaviour are more acceptable in a relationship than physical abuse. And while of course we welcome that the vast majority know that physical domestic abuse is wrong, I believe we need to get, in this, get to the same place with psychological domestic abuse as well. Another issue which I believe the Scottish Government should consider looking into is the way the officers, the officers will be informed on how to use the new legislation. If you take the example of England and Wales, where they have introduced legislation to do with coercive control, in the first six months of their new law, eight out of their 22 police forces didn't charge a single person, and a further nine police forces charged two or fewer people. I believe the government needs to consider this going forward and ensure our officers will have a high level of awareness and understanding of the new laws, which, if necessary, should include specialist training. The need for training of the officers is also highlighted by Callum Steele of the Scottish Police Federation, who, when he spoke to the committee, he correctly pointed out that there was a fundamental difference between, the arresting, between arresting on the basis of physical evidence and the interpretation of whether there had been psychological abuse. This would be a step change for officers and they will need support accordingly. Deputy Presiding Officer, um, in conclusion, I think we would all agree that we'd want our police officers to be able to use their power, the new powers as quickly and as effectively as possible from day one to help combat this dreadful domestic abuse. Thank you. Thank you. I call Sandra White, followed by Kezia Dugdale. Ms White, please. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. Can I agree with the previous speaker in regards to training? But I think what we really need to look at is a cultural change as well, training in, in a, a cultural change. Because for many, many years, domestic violence, which I really don't like the title, I've always called it violence, um, 
for many years it was accepted until we got a cultural change and that was through laws and through advertising as well. So whilst I think training, absolutely agree with you, it's very important. We do need a cultural change within society that uh, this not just uh, physical domestic abuse, but obviously psychological uh, abuse is absolutely unacceptable and it's happening all around us uh, all the time. We might not recognise it just now, but hopefully we will once the legislation goes through and it takes time to, to bed in. Uh, and I must say, uh, you know, uh, the colleagues that before me have stated in their contributions, uh, you know, welcome this legislation. I certainly do welcome the legislation, uh, certainly as much as many organisations and agencies do too. I'm reminded of Scottish uh, Women's Aid who have said of the bill, uh, basically will bridge the gap in addressing controlling behaviours not covered by existing offences and crimes, particularly those that cannot be dealt with via common assault, threatening and abusive behaviour and stalking. And they do go on to say, victim survivors have been telling us this for 40 years, that the harm from emotional and psychological abuse is the most traumatic. And I must say, presiding officer, um, they're absolutely correct. And as the, the cab sect mentioned in his opening remarks, uh, yes, domestic abuse is not the only form of abuse. Physical abuse, obviously, is part of domestic abuse, but it's not the only form. The abuse we are talking about today, and I'm so pleased that this is going through, and I, I do welcome the Justice Committee's work on this. I know that they're very dedicated on these, these particular issues. When you look at uh, controlling, intimidating, threatening behaviour, that's all psychological abuse. And it can start off, unfortunately, or, uh, as a drip drip effect. People are basically told, um, withholding your money, and it leads on to you have no money, so therefore you're unable to go out. Therefore, you're unable to buy yourself clothes. Therefore, you're unable to see your friends and family. You're told what to wear or not to wear. You're told that you're stupid, you're worthless. So many times that, unfortunately, the victim, and they are victims, begin to believe it. And that's the psychological drip, drip effect that's happening for, as uh, Women's Aid said, more than 40 years that they've been uh, made aware of it. And it goes on all the time until you're meant to basically feel worthless all the time and like uh, others on the justice committee i do want to thank most sincerely the people who gave evidence having served the justice committee i know how traumatic it is under various bills uh, and it is very traumatic and i do thank them very very much for for, for doing that and, and really support this piece of legislation another piece that i really really support and welcome is the fact that the bill recognizes that third parties can be used by a perpetrator, and in most instances, this would be a child or a young person. It's not been recognised before, and I know that was evidence that was given that the asset this would be recognised. There's normally a child there. Now that is recognised that third parties can be, a child or young people, can be used by a perpetrator to push this further. And I thank the government for taking uh, the evidence and, and that on board as well. And obviously most organisations and agencies have welcomed this approach. Uh, witnesses from organisations working with children and young people told the committee that the inclusion of the aggravator showed that the Scottish Government had listened, and I thanked them for that previously, and responded to concerns raised during the pre-legislative consultation, as it hadn't actually been uh, included in the initial consultation. And I know I'm slightly run out of time, presiding officer, but I just wanted to raise one particular uh, group in my area, which is run by Glasgow Women's Aid, which uh, provides support to mothers and children, and that's the CEDAR project. Uh, they set up the CEDAR project, Children Experience Domestic Abuse Recovery, five-year project which delivers specialist support to women and children in the city centre and the east end of Glasgow. And they offer support by addressing the behavioural, emotional and social difficulties that children and young people can experience because of domestic abuse. And I think we've got to remember that also, whilst there is a physical abuse and the psychological abuse, children are absolutely affected by it also. So I welcome that part too. Thank you very much, President Officer. Thank you. I, I do have some time in hand, so I can give you all a little bit of leeway, 30 seconds. I know it doesn't sound like much, but as nobody's intervening, I've got to use up the time. Uh, and I'm not very often saying that here. I call Kezia Dugdale, followed by Rona McKay. Ms Dugdale. Be delighted to assist you in that effort, President Officer. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. This is a bill uh, which is about improving the justice system and how it serves uh, victims of domestic abuse and how it punishes the perpetrators of domestic abuse. What it can't do, though, is eradicate domestic abuse. 
And I'd like to start by reminding the Chamber that abuse is about the exercision of power. And for as long as women are unequal in society, domestic abuse will persist. This bill could be perfect and it would still persist. And that's why we must redouble our efforts about the wider goal of achieving gender equality within society. And on that point, presiding officer, I love Paisley, but Paisley as a city of culture was given six minute speeches for backbenchers yesterday. Whilst we consider a stage one debate today, I have but four minutes to talk about a piece of legislation. And I can't help but ask whether that's a product of having a business bureau that comprises entirely of men. On the issue of the bill that we're considering today, I very much welcome it. I welcome the contributions from all the Justice Committee members. I welcome the way in which this bill has been produced by consulting on a number of occasions about different aspects of the bill. And I welcome the principles which constitute that bill. You've heard from Claire Baker that we wholeheartedly support the principles of it. Therefore, like Claire Baker, I'd like to focus on what's missing from the bill and return to the issue of the need for a parallel offence of domestic abuse against children to be included at a further stage. And in I encourage the Cabinet Secretary to look at the evidence from Scottish Women's Aid about the requirement for this. Equally, I think it's important to consider uh, how good emergency banning orders would be because the evidence has told us already uh, how ineffective exclusion orders are within the civil system. I'm a cynical soul these days, presiding officer, uh, for a number of reasons. So I like to consider how the principles of this bill might operate in practice. And there is a history in this parliament of doing brave things, of producing grand world leading legislation and then not fulfilling its promise when it comes to delivering that in practice. Just yesterday in education questions, I talked about uh, how proud I was of the Children and Young People Act and the provisions that had within it for continuing care for looked after young people. Yet I was able to expose that 99% of the young people who should have access to that provision currently are not. I'm sure this chamber would be united in its hope that what we're trying to do with this bill will actually be realized in practice. But in order to do that, I think there are four things we need to consider education and training, resources, publicity, and the relationship that this bill will have with the rest of the justice system. When it comes to education and training, and this was a point made earlier already by a Conservative colleague, we have to make sure that the understanding of the principles behind this bill is provided in training to staff who will have any contact with it altogether. My colleague Claire Baker has also discussed the issue of resourcing. We know that cuts to refugees, uh, refuge services are already a considerable issue in constituencies across the country, as is cuts to community policing, as are pressures on housing. I've talked in this chamber before about meeting a woman who was the victim of domestic abuse, who was stuck in a refuge for 18 months because the housing list was so considerable. She wanted to move on from that experience, but she simply couldn't. We will have to do a good job of advertising the benefits of this bill to the wider public, just as the government have done on the issue of revenge porn. And I can commend them for the publicity campaign that's gone along with that. But ultimately, we also have to look at the relationship between this bill and the rest of the justice system. And some colleagues have already referred to the relationship between this and contact orders when it comes to families with children, where that is a necessary issue. One thing we've perhaps talked less about today is criminal procedure, and I very much welcome the sections of the bill which address that. And in closing, presiding officer, I can't help but think about what would this bill mean for the constituents that I've met in my time uh, as a member of this parliament. And I can think of one particular woman who came to my surgery who had experienced uh, domestic abuse. And this bill would have helped her, but it won't go quite enough uh, in her mind. If I can just um, give you some examples of her experience. She came to visit me to talk about uh, what life was like for her and her children having been subject of an abusive partner. Uh, her children had had to give evidence by remote site, but the Edinburgh remote site was closed. She had to travel to Livingston to do that, and that caused a great deal of um, discomfort for the family. The children weren't given enough um, uh, kind of forward knowledge about what that would be like to give video evidence in court. They weren't told that they would be uh, streamed live, not just to the judge, but to the whole courtroom. And they were very alarmed to hear about that uh, after the event. Uh, that court case had had the trial date moved on four separate occasions because the defender was trying to uh, pr prolong it uh, uh, deliberately. And that in itself was a form of abuse. The accused faced 30 different charges, was eventually convicted on 10 counts with three not proven verdicts, but was released for background checks prior to sentencing. When he was bailed, he absconded. And then when he was caught, he was bailed again. That's an issue which won't be addressed by this court and this, uh, in today's proceedings, but it is an issue about criminal procedure, which I would encourage the Justice Secretary to look at again. And on that note, I'll close. Thank you. Thank you very much.
I call Rona Mackay to be followed by John Finney. Ms Mackay, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Today is a historic day in the Chamber as we debate the general principles of the Stage 1 Domestic Abuse Scotland Bill. It's historic because this bill for the first time introduces psychological abuse into the repugnant crime of domestic abuse. It has two main purposes. It creates a new offence of engaging in a course of abusive conduct against a partner or ex-partner and it amends other procedural or evidential aspects of criminal law into, in relation to domestic abuse. In other words, it recognises the damage that psychological abuse, abuse can do and makes it a crime in its own right. It addresses a gap in criminal law allowing for convictions of domestic abuse based on a course of conduct that includes psychological abuse rather than individual incidents. Because we all know that psychological and emotional abuse is just as painful as physical abuse. You might not see the bruises, but controlling and coercive behaviour eats away at the soul and self-esteem of the victim each and every day. The evidence the committee has, been, has heard was heartbreaking at, time, at all times, and I thank the witnesses for their immense bravery in telling us their stories so that others will not suffer the way they did. Domestic violence, physical or psychological, exists in all sections of our communities across all levels of society. As we've heard, mental and emotional abuse includes threats, criticism of appearance and intellect, name calling, controlling what you do, your access to money, where you go, how you dress and who you speak to, among many other degrading control me mechanisms. And the cowardly abuser knows no bounds. They'll threaten your children, isolate you from family and friends, in effect, try to make you a non-person. It's all about control and controlling by fear. This bill aims to tackle all forms of this vile crime. It's been welcomed by a wide variety of organisations, as we've heard, such as Scottish Women's Aid, the Law Society of Scotland, Children First and the NSPCC, to name but a few. Presiding officer, children are the forgotten victims of domestic violence. The ways in which children can be harmed by domestic abuse are wider than simply witnessing the abuse itself. The trauma is long-lasting and far-reaching. That's why I'm delighted that this bill provides for a statutory aggravator for instances of partner abuse in which a third party, usually children, are involved. The aggravator wasn't part of the Scottish Government's initial consultation on the bill, but as we listened to stakeholders, children's charities and women's groups, it was clear there was a need for the children to be recognised as major victims of this crime. However, as we've heard, there's a view among children's organisations that abuse of children in domestic violence cases should be recognised in its own right. And I have to say I have sympathy with this. The government believes that the bill strikes the right balance and that any major reform of the criminal law and the abuse of children is best considered separately and it's currently under review. I sincerely hope that this will reflect the urgent need for recognising the devastating effect domestic violence can have on children. Another welcome measure is that the bill requires the court to consider whether to impose a non-harassment order to protect the victim. Scottish Women's Aid believe it's critical that NHOs cover children too and that courts should be more willing to consider refusing contract, contact to abusive parents. I agree with that too and I'm pleased that the Cabinet Secretary is considering it. I'm also pleased that emergency barring orders are being considered and that the Cabinet Secretary will enter into a dialogue with third sector organisations for consideration of this measure at stage two of this bill. Presiding officer, there's not enough time to do justice to all aspects of this important bill. I, I agree with Kezia Dugdale, it's, uh, it's just far too short. Um, but I hope that between us across the chamber, we've covered most of the salient points. The bill aims to expose the inadequate bullies who perpetrate controlling and coercive behavior and send a message to them that it will not be tolerated any longer. For that reason, I'm proud to recommend the general principles of the Stage 1 Domestic Abuse Scotland Bill to the Chamber. Thank you. As I said, there is some time in hand, so you can stay a little longer. Uh, call John Finney, followed by Ben McPherson. Mr Finney, uh, please. Thank you, President Officer. A, a number of people have talked about filling a gap. Indeed, uh, Scottish Women's Aid uh, mentioned that in the briefing, and I'd like to thank them and others for, for their briefing. The Cabinet Secretary used a, 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 a phrase when he was talking about this, and he said the next important steps. I think this is a, a, an important uh, step. I think there's more to go, and that's been alluded to with the comments about the children's uh, legislation. Um, it is about a course of conduct that includes uh, um, psychological abuse, and, and that's laid out in uh, Section 2. And I think it's important that it's a non-exhaustive list, because it is for the courts 
to and it remains open for the courts to decide. And I, I would align myself with some comments from, I think it was Claire Baker who talked about the important role that domestic abuse courts can play. And I've, I've long been an advocate of running that out and people having a clear understanding that it's about, it's about the timetabling of events rather than new buildings. This is about scheduling and people working together and surely that's what we want in relation to this. I want to, to, to read you one phrase from the Scottish Women's Aid um, um, briefing, which I thought was particularly significant. And, um, it is that the new law offers a, a, a policy sea change by focusing our criminal justice response on the actions of the perpetrator rather than the circumstances of the victim. By doing so, it will enable better understanding of domestic abuse and its impact on women, children and young people in our communities, institution and country. Now, to, to uh, inform our um, background, our investigation of this, this legislation, we did hear testimony, and that's been alluded to uh, by a, a number of people. Indeed, in our report, we say uh, we receive compelling and persuasive evidence that psychological abuse within relationships or by an ex-partner can cause immense and enduring trauma and, and harm. Powerful and moving private testimony is how it's also referred to elsewhere in the report. And I'd like to pay respect to these uh, women, because this is primarily gender-based violence. It's not exclusively, but that's what it is. I'd like to pay it to great respect to them. Um, and I think it's very important to say that confidentiality must be respected. But in some respects, it's disappointing because these women can do far more at explaining the need for this bill and more than any politician uh, can do. Uh, so it's great thanks that's due to them. Um, and the, the, the courage um, was for a number of reasons. Um, a lot of these people who from a, a wide range of backgrounds and a wide range of uh, um, geographies, a lot of them had to relocate and the effect wasn't just the relationship with the partner but it was with the wider family. So I think laws are intended to indicate and reflect society's views on a given issue and I think as a, a number of people have said there's been a welcome change in relation to domestic uh, uh, abuse, domestic violence, but we do have a way to go. I'd like to uh, touch on uh, the question of how the police will respond to this. And I think it was important someone said that uh, Chief Inspector, Chief Superintendent of Edgar Baron Bogue talked about there's nothing new in this. There is nothing new in this. The change that's taken place in respect of how police respond to historic issues of, of violence, that won't be their initial reaction when they attend at the scene of a, an allegation. It's the subsequent inquiry that will unearth this. And we've seen some tremendous work by Police Scotland in relation to serial uh, abusers whose violence hasn't just been visited in one female victim, one household, but a series of them, sometimes over decades. And some of the salutary sentences quite rightly reflect the damage they've done to a number of lives. So I have every confidence that the police working with the prosecutors can properly address this. And judgments will always have to be made, but that's the case with every piece of legislation. Um, and I don't think we need anything to fear with that. Another term that's been used in the port was hard to reach groups. Well, the survivors that we heard from and the people who were, that this legislation will assist should it pass, and I sincerely hope it will, they've been hard to reach. They've been felt abandoned. And I think what people have talked about, the effect that the criminal justice system has on people, it should be supporting people, it should be helping people. It should not be victimizing them further. Very limited time, I appreciate um, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, but uh, I think it's important to quote um, some of the, the evidence also from Children First, also covered by other people. And they talk about a mandatory, mandatory duty on court to consider whether to impose non-harassment order that includes the children in all cases where the statutory ag aggravation in relation to the child is considered. And I think that's very important. If we're going to recognise it in the aggravation, then it should be uh, um, and, uh, picked up in the order. And it's important for another reason, because it's the, the well-documented fact that child contact is, a, is an occasion and a location where the further abuse continues, the psychological abuse. So I hope that that will be looked at as, as we go forward. And uh, again, a comment from Scottish Women's Aid, to ensure that abusive behaviour dealt with by the criminal courts is regarded as a prima facie evidence of unsuitability for contact with a child. And I think that's important. Um, I gave you an extra minute, so many, if you many could thanks just I certainly lend some full support to the legislature. Thank, Thank you. you. I call Ben McPherson to follow by Liam MacArthur. Mr McPherson, please. Thank you, President Officer. As others have said, psychological abuse within a relationship or by an ex-partner can cause immense and enduring trauma and harm. And as a member of the Justice Committee, when we took evidence, this was underlined most powerfully and movingly by the survivors that we heard from. 
and met with and, and also from the many remarkable support agencies that are supporting survivors today and across Scotland. What was clear was that domestic abuse is a multi-dimensional scourge on our society and all of us, which affects a range of relationships, but particularly relations unequal relationships between men and women. It affects those across classes, across wealth, across ethnicity, and across age. And that's why I strongly support the principles of this bill to create a new offence engaging in, of engaging in an abusive course of conduct because that is the lived reality of this abuse on the ground. It is the lived experience of victims as we speak. And it takes account of the context and impact of domestic abuse. The proposed offence addresses a gap in the existing law by recognising, and that's an important word, that domestic abuse may not only damage or violate a victim's physical integrity, but also undermine a victim's character, restricting a victim's autonomy and freedom and their ability to live their life in the manner they choose. The reason I said that word recognition is important is because not only will this law, if passed, empower our courts to deal with that scourge in our society more effectively, but it also helps clarify in our society that that coercive, controlling behaviour is unacceptable. Because some of the survivors that we heard from said very movingly that at the beginning they weren't quite clear if they were being abused. So the, the clarity of passing this law will make it absolutely clear across society and particularly with victim suffering that they will know when they are being abused more easily and that the criminal law will be clear in its ability to take judicial action on their behalf in the interests of justice. I think it's important to also recognise that the gendered approach within this bill is something that I support and I think it's the right thing to do because as other speakers have said this piece of legislation is within a wider context of gender equality and addressing violence against women and that's why not just getting the legislation right, not just making sure that the criminal justice system is ready to and, and, and resourced appropriately to enact the new powers and the new abilities that this law would give in order to create greater justice. Others have touched on a publicity campaign and it's, they're absolutely right that it's important that there is a government-led publicity campaign and that there's training to make sure that others in the criminal justice system and the third sector are able to support and uh, give effect to this, this bill's intention. But that greater awareness and that publicity campaign has already started with the introduction of this bill and the stage process that we're at. And I'd like to draw the, the, the Parliament's attention in, in closing to one project that's been launched today by Scottish Women's Aid, which is their 1,000 Words project, which is a photo project. And it's putting forward 15 new images of what domestic abuse looks like to get away from the perception that domestic abuse is only about physical harm and to illuminate the fact that it is deeper than that and it is multifaceted and that all of that range of abuse is something that we should tackle. And this bill will make a remarkable difference on that journey, and I fully support it. Thank you very much. I call Liam MacArthur to be followed by Fulton McGregor. Mr MacArthur, please. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. Can I start to by confirming Scottish Liberal Democrats' unequivocal support uh, for this bill to tackle controlling and coerc uh, coercive domestic abuse. Well, I think Kezia Dugdale was absolutely uh, right to warn about the limits that any uh, bill, however good, 
uh, can achieve on its own. Can I thank to all those who gave uh, both written and oral evidence to the committee and pay, like others, particular tribute to the survivors of domestic abuse that we heard from, uh, whose often harrowing testimony vividly brought home uh, to all of us how psychological abuse can be every bit as damaging, as traumatising, as long-lasting uh, to the victim as physical abuse. And for all the strides that have been made since the establishment of this parliament in terms of heightened public awareness, political priority, changes in legislation, too often uh, prosecution of psychological abuse has proved difficulty. And that difficulty in prosecution has made it difficult to reinforce the messages about how unacceptable this sort of controlling and coercive behaviour is. And difficult, therefore, in turn to persuade victims to come forward. I think Ben McPherson was absolutely right that victims are looking for more clarity and certainty, that the abuse that they have suffered will be recognised and actions taken against perpetrators. So as I say, Scottish Liberal Democrats strongly support the principles of this bill and welcome the contribution it can make to closing the current gap in our uh, criminal law. And I look forward to working with committee colleagues, with ministers and stakeholders uh, to improve and strengthen the bill in a number of areas. And there were uh, a range of questions that were raised with the committee during stage one. Initially, there was a debate about whether or not the scope should be broadened out to encompass wider family relationships, including uh, elder abuse. And while this appears to be the approach adopted in recent uh, legislation south of the border, from the evidence we heard, I'm certainly persuaded that the nature of the abuse between partners and ex-partners demands a laser-like focus and response. That is not to say there isn't a recognition of the impact that domestic abuse can have on children in a relationship or household. While the bill does acknowledge this and establish a specific aggravation, uh, women, Scottish Women's Aid and others are right, I think, in arguing that the effect is not just on a child who sees, hears or is present at the, in the house during a particular incident. A child's experience is invariably interwoven with that of their abused parent and this needs to be, I think, better reflected in the bill. More controversially, perhaps, we also considered if the evidential bar for prosecuting coercive and controlling behaviour was set at the appropriate level. We had concerns from legal experts, the Police Federation and others that the bill may risk criminalising behaviour that, while unpleasant, should not be considered a criminal offence. And initially, I admit I was persuaded by some of those concerns, but over the course of the evidence that we heard, I became increasingly satisfied that the tests were sufficiently robust, and I think the government's response to the committee's report is uh, further helpful in clarifying that position. Turning to non-harassment orders, it's absolutely right that courts should be required to consider these in any case of domestic abuse, but we can go further. Uh, Children First argues, John Finney reminded us, that in all cases where a statutory aggravation is applied, the court should be required to consider an order covering the child or children as well, and this seems to have merit, and we will return to that at stage two. Similarly, emergency barring orders in more serious cases could, I think, play an important role, and I welcome the government's uh, continued engagement with the third sector in developing proposals which the committee will consider and take evidence on again at stage two. More work is also needed, as others have said, in tying down the details around the resources needed to make this legislation uh, when implemented as successful as possible. There's a welcome acceptance by ministers of the critical importance that training and awareness raising can play, but perhaps insufficient clarity around the scale of what actually might be needed. And I think the, the Cabinet Secretary might helpfully set out his thoughts in more detail in winding up. Finally, I note that Scottish Women's Aid is highly critical of the committee uh, about any suggestion uh, that it might be diversions away from prosecution. And for my part, I accept that uh, criticism. And while this will always be a matter for the Crown Office, I think uh, the more appropriate debate to be had is in relation to alternatives to custodial sentences in certain circumstances. In conclusion, Deputy Presiding Officer, I'm in no doubt at all about the devastating and enduring impact that this sort of coercive controlling behaviour can have on a victim undermining their sense of self, hollowing them out slowly but surely over time. At present, the criminal law in Scotland is inadequate to deal with su such abhorrent and pernicious abuse. I'm pleased that this bill can play an important part in writing that wrong and will have great pleasure in supporting the general principles at decision, -making, decision, decision time this evening. Thank you. Thank you. I call Fulton McGregor to be followed by Gordon Lindhurst. Mr McGregor, please. Thank you, President Officer. I'm, uh, like others, pleased to speak in this debate and I'm immensely proud that the Justice Committee have unanimously agreed to the principles of this bill. Five parties all completely agreed about this piece of legislation. 
How often do we say that? That says something about Scotland and that says something about this Parliament and we should all be very proud. During committee, we heard evidence upon evidence, as others have said, that the bill was needed, that there is a gap in the law protecting victims from psychological abuse, Scottish Women's Aid, Abused Men in Scotland, all the children's charities, social work, the police, the Crown Procurator Fiscal Service and victims themselves. And that's just to name a few. And my own experience as a social worker told me the same. 12 years in a local office setting, I'd lost count of how many times I sat at a child protection conference, a children's hearing, a MAPA meeting or some other forum and heard evidence of often a pervasive pattern of psychological and emotional abuse, often over a long period of time. The police, social and health services often having nowhere concrete to go with this. This is a law which is groundbreaking and will make a real difference to service intervention and most importantly, the lives of those suffering at the hands of this abuse, and which mostly, as others have said, is men. I don't want to sound too sucky up here to the Cabinet Secretary, but because this is an area that has been a part of my life through work for a long time and means a lot to me, I do think if this bill is passed, he can be very proud and think back in many years to come as this being an absolutely outstanding achievement that will have positively impacted the lives of many and helped change the culture in this country. Presiding officer, like others, I do want to address some of the issues of the committee report um, and that the government responded to. Uh, and, and much has already been saying so that it said so there is a risk of repeating um, things, but it's worthwhile doing. There was a very small, and I stress that, a small number of stakeholders who expressed concern that the bar uh, is set too low. I don't agree with that. And the committee heard evidence, for example, from Anne-Marie Hicks, for, um, from the Crown, Prosecutor, uh, Crown and Prosecutor and Fiscal Service, who did not think that this was the case. Uh, and I welcome the response from the government, um, as others have mentioned, which outlines the three thresholds which are required to be met. Uh, and I'm sure that the, the, the Cabinet Secretary will, will highlight those. During evidence gathering, the subject of children who are exposed to this behaviour generated a lot of discussion, and I think most speakers have mentioned that. I welcome the government's response in relation to the review of the Children's Scotland Act, including a review of child contact cases as they relate to domestic violence. Also, I welcome consideration of amendments at stage two to allow non-harassment orders to protect children specifically. I also think it is a positive step that the government are meeting uh, with Women's Aid about emergency barring orders, and I would also encourage dialogue on this front with the children's charities, such as Children First, uh, Chloe Riddle from that service, who I met earlier today and we discussed this um, very issue. Finally, President Officer, I'd like to follow up on a question that I asked the Cabinet Secretary in his recent statement um, to this chamber. I do believe that the introduction of this offence and the subsequent publicity that it's produced will lead to more convictions. And I know the Scottish Government, I know firsthand from working in the field, have invested strongly in criminal justice, for example, uh, in, in the area of female offending recently. But we will need to ensure that funding is increased for male perpetrators, because it is particularly male perpetrators, of domestic violence. Programmes can work, but they need, to, they need people who can specialise and do the intense work. It takes a lot of work to change people's belief systems. The change in Caledonia programmes are examples of this, and I would also like to take this opportunity here to encourage local authorities to use the government uh, investment to create specific posts for people who, who work in this area and allow them to affect change. And uh, uh, there are some local authorities that do it, but I'd like to see local authorities actually have specific teams that can work around domestic abuse, as they do for other uh, areas of criminal justice. And I think that would be a step in, the right, step in the right direction. I see I'm just over four minutes, presiding officer, so you'll be glad to know I'm finishing. I welcome this bill um, and commend it to the chamber. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Gordon Lindhurst, followed by Christina McKelvey. And Christina McKelvey will be our last speaker in the open debate. Mr. Mm. Lindhurst. Deputy Presiding Officer, close and intimate personal relationships are an integral part of our lives. Sharing life with a husband or wife, for example, learning more about each other and experiencing life together can be some of the most precious times in life. But when relationships break down, whether momentarily, temporarily, or permanently, such moments can be the worst any of us face. Worse still is a situation where two people have placed trust and love in each other only for one of them to turn around and abuse that trust through physical or psychological maltreatment. Such abuse can, of course, take many forms and leave deep emotional wounds which last long after a physical bruise or scar may appear to have healed. 
And so complex can human relationships be that a victim may not initially realize what is happening. It is that sort of complicated set of circumstances that we look at now as lawmakers. I'm sure we are all agreed that our purpose should be to target serious wrongdoings rather than what might be categorized as occasionally irrational behavior. Human weaknesses can, of course, often cause disagreements to take place within a relationship. And as Andrew Tickle of Glasgow Caledonian University Law School said in evidence, and I quote, even broadly healthy relationships are occasionally characterized by hurtful conduct, jealous behavior, and distressing episodes. Callum Steele's evidence has been referred to already, uh, one part of it anyway, but it was also his experience that once the criminal justice system becomes involved, that involvement can itself become a source of regret and distress to individuals. So the question is, is the draft legislation before us sufficiently clear, or does it blur the line between a pattern of unacceptable coercive and controlling behavior on the one hand and irregular friction on the other? Does it overcriminalize? The Glasgow Bar Association referred to a wide scope of behaviors which may be criminalized by this bill. A low threshold to establish a course of behavior was a concern raised by others, including the Law Society of Scotland. For example, and this has been referred to already, um, distress is a measure of the impact of a person's behavior towards another. And I say that this is a valid and important question, which others also referred to. Is the bar being set too low? I'll, I'll take the intervention. John Finney. Thank you, President Officer. I'm grateful for the member taking the intervention. Would the member accept that it's the judgment of the individual who chooses to pick up the phone and say, I require the police's assistance that we must take cognizance of? Matters will develop as a result of that, but it's their judgment. Uh, yes, of Gordon course. It is, it is always the, the judgment of the individual who picks up the phone and calls the police as to whether or not they should do that. So I, I don't uh, demur from that at all. That is, of course... Uh, no. Um, let us contrast the Scottish Bill classification of behaviour as coercive or controlling, even if it has happened on only two occasions with the Serious Crime Act 2015 for England and Wales. The definition there refers to repeatedly or continuously engaging in behaviour towards another person. And Home Office guidance on the 2015 Act makes clear that courts should look for evidence of a pattern of behavior established over a period of time rather than one or two isolated incidents which do not appear to establish a pattern. A serious concern arises on this point. Law should be clear. And those of us like myself who have been involved in the prosecution of these types of cases in the, under the current system uh, do understand that and those involved know that these are sensitive matters that need to be looked at very carefully. As Mr. Tickle said, rather than trusting prosecutors to use the law as it was intended, legislators should try to get the law right in the first place. And I'm sure that that is what we're all trying to be doing here and what we agree we should be doing. So in conclusion, without demurring in any way from the principles of this bill, um, I would say that I'm not entirely satisfied that all of the concerns raised have been addressed and that the important point is we want the Act to work. And if it is to work, then we need to see that it will work in practice because it is watertight so that it has its agreed intended effect. Thank you. Thank you. Christina McKelvey, then closing speeches. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. The poet and domestic abuse survivor, Christy Ann Martin, wrote this. You can't keep her in a cage, clip her wings and tell her lies. Say that fragile birds will never meant to fly. Watch her live behind a rusty door, latched tight. Her spirit slipping away so you can keep her in sight. Beautiful creatures cannot be confined. Her wings will grow she'll find the sky. I'll talk about that in a wee minute, presiding officer. But around one in three women and a grown number of men 
have become victims of domestic abuse. And we would like to think that we find this behaviour completely and utterly appalling and disgusting, which we do, but some are still too inclined to brush it under the carpet. But we know it's still happening. The evidence tells us that. We are better informed by statistics, but too many victims are still fearful of seeking redress. Perhaps some people, particularly, though not exclusively, the abusers, have thought, oh well, he'll get over it. He'll get over the broken bones, the bruises, the smashed teeth, your life goes on. But we know through the evidence from the committee and from other avenues that that is certainly not the case for many victims. The question is, presiding officer, are we doing enough? We need to wipe out home-based domestic violence and make it completely unacceptable, that culture change that my colleague spoke about. With the right tools in place, Scotland can become an exemplar and really chip away at an old, outdated notion of it's none of my business pal mentality. That can be through grassroots community work. We've heard of many of the organisations. I'd like to thank them for all of their help and support for the work that I do in co-chairing the cross-party group with my colleague Claire Baker. We have seen some improvements. We've seen, in many cases, huge improvements through locally led groups and some of the ones that I work with, South Lanarkshire Women's Aid, Lanarkshire Rape Crisis, and the brilliant work of the Stamp Project doing work in schools. Presiding officer, this bill tackles one of my biggest concerns. That is coercive control in that victims who are not aware of being isolated from friends or family, having access to money and bank accounts restricted, or having personal medical conditions revealed, is domestic abuse. And it needs to be a criminal offence. This decimates human lives. Using gestures and eye contact to warn or control another's behaviour can be undetectable to most of us, but devastating to the person who is the target of that type of coercive control. The Justice, the Justice Committee saw so much compelling and persuasive evidence of psychological abuse to see it as a real and pernicious issue, the effect of which can be every, every bit as harmful as any violent abuse. Presiding officer, it is important to add here that an increasing number of victims are young men and women in, in the LGBTI community. Having a same-sex partner doesn't protect you from abuse. They find themselves being bullied, humiliated, laughed at or rejected with psychological or coercive behaviours and, of course, the physical violence that comes with that. We have to be mindful that that's what's happening now. And in its submission to the, Scot the Scottish Women's Aid welcomed the principles behind the legislation and said, and I quote, the new law offers a policy sea change by focusing our criminal justice response on the actions of the perpetrator rather than the circumstances of the victim. And by doing so, it will enable better understanding of domestic abuse and its impact on women, children and young people in our communities, institution and our country. I agree with them. But our present law leaves a gap that this bill, I hope, will close. It will give better protection to victims seeking redress for acts that will be criminal in law. At the moment, if you want to take a case, you really have to do so under a claim that your physical integrity has been attacked or threatening behaviour has caused you fear and alarm. Fundamentally, this bill carefully defines the offence of engaging in abusive course of conduct against a partner or ex-partner, enhances the power of the police and improves protection for the victim. And that's notwithstanding some of the asks that people have asked for today. Here's my ask, providing officer, in, in conclusion. I would ask the Scottish Government to strengthen the bill when it comes to the impact on children. I know Scottish Women's Aid have some proposals on this issues, and I would also welcome the Scottish Government confirmation of the review of the Children Scotland Act 1995. will include consideration of this, and I would reiterate Kezia Dugdale's call for similar, similar mindfulness. I would also ask, ask the Scottish Government to be mindful in its review of short-term sentencing during the process of the bill, and I'm sure that there's many organisations will tell you why they have concerns about that. In this bill, we have an opportunity, presiding officer, to break the locks of that cage I spoke about at the beginning. And we begin with this contribution. Please conclude. Why would anyone stand in the way of those essential Thank principles? You. I don't. Thank you. I didn't want you to eat at the time of closing speeches. I call Rhoda Grant to close for Labour. Ms Grant, five minutes, please. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, this Parliament has from the very outset set out on a journey to combat violence against women. And it's good to see this bill progressing and that there's support for the need to extend domestic abuse legislation beyond physical abuse to emotional, emotional and coercive control within a relationship. 
And yet that's not the end of the journey. There are many more issues that need for, to be further examined and legislated on. Hopefully some of these can be included in the stage two of this bill, but those that cannot must be given priority. Our vision must be creating a country where we have true equality and an end to violence against women. We need to look at the legislation regarding children, victims of domestic abuse, and adequate resourcing of police social services and support services such as Women's Aid, um, who do wonderful work in this area. Indeed, Claire Baker, my colleague, paid tribute to them um, more than 40 years in existence and still working to battle um, this curse. We recognise the devastation that domestic abuse causes to women. However, we need to understand that children of the relationship are damaged too. And this was a uh, point made by my colleagues, Claire Baker, Kezia Dugdale, and others, including Rona Mackay and many others in this debate. The bill deals with situations where a child is used as an aggravator to further the abuse against the adult victim. It does not uh, deal with the impact of domestic abuse on the child. And domestic abuse can have long-term and catastrophic impacts on a child. And we had a briefing from Children First, and they said, an increasing body of robust international evidence recognises domestic abuse as one of 10 types of traumatic, adverse childhood experiences. It can increase the likelihood of people developing chronic diseases, mental ill health, and a range of negative social and emotional impacts, such as, the victim, uh, such as being a victim of violence throughout their lives. That is the impact on children in a domestic abuse, brought up in a domestic abuse relationship. And until we recognise that impact and protect them, we're falling short of our duty of care to them. Liam MacArthur um, talked about the child's experience being interlinked totally with that of their abused parents. A review of the Children's Scotland Act 1995 will take time and more children will suffer in the interim. And there are things that we can do in this bill that will save many more children from being harmed while that takes place. I have many cases where child access arrangements are used to continue the abuse beyond the end of a relationship. Added to the impact of the abuse itself, this has long-term impacts on the child. Casework where a mother is forced to send her child into a dangerous place by the courts. This is surely not acceptable. I believe that access arrangements in situations of domestic abuse need to form part of the disposal. The proposal from Scottish Women's Aid, Children First and other expert stakeholders that children should be provided with a non-harassment order in their own right would prevent a civil court from forcing them to have contact with an abusive parent. I would argue that an abusive parent should not have any access to a child until they can prove that they have changed their, their behaviour. A parent who creates a situation that damages a child should surely relinquish all their parental rights. This is the case under child protection. It's just that we don't recognise the damage witnessing abuse does to a child. Michael Matheson in his opening statement said that he would deal with this in new legislation. And indeed, there are wide issues that can be dealt with in new legislation. But domestic abuse courts and experts recognise what a children's hearing or a civil court might not. There must be no gaps that in protection. And I would urge the Cabinet Secretary to look at this again, as others have urged him to do in this debate. There is op some opposition to the bill, and Liam Kerr pointed out that a, a minority of those giving evidence expressed reservations concerning the wording and practical effect of the new offence. Some legal, legal experts and police officers said that it was difficult to legislate in the realm of human relationship. And this takes me back to the days when a domestic was something that was referred to. And it's sad to see that that seems to resonate with some, in some quarters still today. These views would indicate a need for additional training of police and prosecutors, given abuse of this kind is easily recognised to the trained eye. And people made, uh, Morris Corey, Kezia Dugdale and Ben McPherson made that point. Please conclude. Um, 
Apologies, Presiding Officer, I could go on for some time. I'm sorry. Let, let me finish by saying that we support this bill. Thank you. It is a step in the right direction, and we hope that we can build it on it on stage two. Thank you very much. I call Michel Ballantyne, close to the Conservative. Seven minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I close today on behalf of the Scottish Conservatives with a sense of sadness that this debate was ever necessary, but also with some hope that we in this Parliament are taking some meaningful steps towards our efforts to tackle something all too prevalent in our society. The Cabinet Minister, Margaret Mitchell, opened the debate very eloquently, setting out the reason we're here and discussing this, and the importance of getting it right so that what we enshrine in law can actually be enforceable and protect the very victims we seek to protect. A victim once described to me the insidious nature of domestic abuse. She said, it picks away at your confidence, often in small ways at first, so that you don't even realize that you are being drawn into an abusive relationship until one day you look in the mirror and it's not you looking back anymore. Your confidence is supplanted by doubt. Your freedom is enveloped by change, chains because psychological manipulation is an evil and systematic poisoning of the soul. And yet our present law is not sufficiently expansive to enable what the COPFS describe as the effective prosecution of psychological abuse and controlling and coercive, coercive behaviour, which may undermine a char victim's character, restrict a victim's autonomy and their ability to live their life in the manner they choose. This bill bridges that gap, and I commend certain elements of its construction. First of all, I welcome the bifurcated test employed in section 12A, allowing the court to take account of any particular circumstances or vulnerabilities of the victim, which may be preyed upon, irrespective of whether that behavior in question would be likely to cause harm to the objective reasonable person. I am also supportive of the inclusion of a recklessness test in determining mens rea in section 12B. This is appropriate, indeed I would say essential, because a perpetrator of domestic abuse can be devious and skilled in manipulation. They may present their conduct in a manner which suggests, at least superficially, that they did not intend to cause harm and therefore did not meet the requisite standard of mens rea. This bill importantly closes that particular back door, allowing effective policing of the specific characteristics of those who control or coerce victims. And I also support the stat statutory aggravation of the offence in section four, which takes into account the harm caused to a child who is exposed to an abusive environment, which rest restricts access and interaction between the victim and child. We have heard from many members today, Sandra White, Kezia Dugdale and Claire Baker, calls that we ensure that the welfare of children caught up in domestic abuse is thoroughly explored during the stages of this bill, and I wholeheartedly support those calls. However, as my Conservative colleagues have highlighted, we have some significant reservations around the drafting of the bill, not because we don't want the bill to pass or to do well during the stages, but it is absolutely vital that we make sure that anything we put into statute is enforceable. Maurice Corrie noted calls for a publicity campaign to be run in conjunction with the bill's enactment and thereafter to raise awareness of the issue of co coercive control and its criminalisation. I would like to add my support to this, and I noted that Kezia Dugdale also echoed this. Ben McPherson made some good points that actually, even though the bill running through Parliament does actually raise, raise um, attention to the issues around domestic abuse, and that there are many pieces of good work already occurring, but that doesn't mean we, can go, we can't go further. And one of the things we should look at is the early intervention and prevention services for young people who have displayed any signs of problematic behaviour in this context. Gordon Lindhurst highlighted the concerns of academics and police that there is a substantial risk of lowering the threshold of criminality due to the amb ambiguity of the word distress in the legislation. We must therefore proceed with caution so as not to open the floodgates to vexatious litigation because this in turn could undermine the cases of those victims who really need support and, and eventually a prosecution. And I fully endorse the comments of Liam Kerr and our advocacy of trialling the one fa family, one judge approach adopted in various countries. 
This could be a vital ancillary means of streamlining the system and ensuring that victims are not forced to relive the experience time and time again. Members, we've heard many, many contributions today about the importance of this bill, and not one of them is invalid. Um, I'd like to just pick up a couple that really struck me. Mary Goujon presented a very powerful contribution around non-harassment orders. That point that only 6% of convicted cases include a non-harassment order and that uh, somebody who is not convicted, sorry, somebody who is convicted can actually walk out and walk back to the, to the victim's home, I think really highlights the, the issues that we're facing as we, as we take this bill through Parliament. And we must make sure that the very protection a woman craves can be effectively um, given by any bill that we put in place. I don't want to, in any shape or form, um, take away from all the calls that have been made, but I do think it is really important that, that we look, as we close out this debate, that the principles which underpin this bill are sound, but what we now need to do is make absolutely sure, as Fulton McGregor highlighted, that we have five parties working together on this. We're in agreement. But what we need to do is, is nail down the details as we take it through the various stages. So I really join Fulton in saying, let's actually work together now to amend and improve the substantive elements of this bill. We must now address the concerns that have been outlined today to ensure that the right balance is struck between the protection of victims and due process in our courts. Yes, there will be differences of opinion. Yes, there will be further debate and discussion. But there should be no doubt that the Scottish Conservatives, and I hope that the whole of this Parliament, will not waver in our drive to effectively legislate and prosecute against domestic abuse in all its forms. We are working to eradicate the scourge of domestic abuse, and I, I support what Kezia Dugdale says in that we will probably never eradicate it, but it is a process, and this bill represents another step forward in that process and I think we should take it forward wholeheartedly. Thank you. Thank you. I call on Michael Matheson to close with the Government Cabinet Secretary till five o'clock, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Can I say I'm very grateful to the, uh, uh, the comments that have been made uh, across the Chamber and across party support for uh, the general principles of this uh, piece of legislation. As I uh, said at the outset in my open remarks, this is a, a unique piece of legislation in that we are seeking to criminalise a course of behaviour, uh, which is novel to Scottish law and to some extent uh, law in the UK as a whole, uh, because it differs from the approach that has been taken in England and Wales. And I will return to that particular point later on. I want, though, to uh, turn to a particular issue around about the, the issue of whether the bar uh, that we have set within this particular bill is at the right level or uh, not, because that's pretty fundamental to the effectiveness of this uh, legislation. And one of the uh, concerns I have is that some of those who believe that the bar has been set too low are overlooking the protections which are built into the bill in order to make sure that we have struck the right balance. So I want to be very clear about how this offence uh, will actually work. Uh, and in specific terms, how the offence and the three conditions that must be met for the offence to be brought into play. The first aspect is that the accused must engage in a course of behaviour which is abusive of their partner or ex-partner. And a reasonable person would consider the course of behaviour would be likely to cause their partner or ex-partner to suffer physical or psychological harm, and the accused either intends the course of behaviour causes their partner or ex-partner to suffer such harm, or they are reckless as to whether the course of behaviour causes such harm. And it's important, President Officer, to remember that the test of whether the accused's behaviour is likely to cause the victim harm applies to the whole abusive course of behaviour and not whether in a single instance of behaviour causes such harm. And alongside that, sign officer, I want to turn to the issue about the threshold of distress 
within the definition of psychological harm. Because some members have raised that particular issue, and Gordon Lindhurst may have raised it in his contribution, and Liam MacArthur and Michelle Ballantyne made reference to it as well. We believe that the term distress is the appropriate level. And the reason I say that, President Officer, is how will courts decide on how to interpret distress and how will they take that into account? And the reality is that what courts will do is they will turn to the dictionary definition of distress. Distress is not synonymous with mere upset or annoyance. The concise Oxford Dictionary defines distress as meaning extreme anxiety or suffering. That's exactly why the Crown Office and Scottish Women's Aid have said that this is where the threshold should be set, because they see extreme anxiety and suffering as being key to bringing this offence into effect. And that's how, with those three criteria and the threshold of distress, we have arrived at this particular threshold, and I believe it is the right threshold for setting this act. And I want to turn to several other issues that members have raised, in particular issues around uh, uh, children and protection to children. Kezia Dugdale raised the issue, Claire Baker, uh, uh, Maria Goujon raised the issue, uh, Marie Goujon raised uh, the issue as well. What I can say is that in relation to non-harassment orders and the committee's suggestion that we should extend the provision of those uh, to children, that I can confirm at stage two we will bring forward amendments in order to do exactly that, to extend the provision uh, to, to children when they are being issued, which sits alongside the mandatory provision that courts will now have at the time of sentencing to take that specifically into uh, to account. I also want to turn to the issue uh, that some others have raised around the interaction between our criminal law and civil law. And Kezia Dugdale raised this issue in particular in making sure that the way in which our justice system is operating is in a comprehensive, holistic manner. And in my view, at the centre of that, when it involves children, it should be the interests of the child that play paramount importance. What we will do, as I've mentioned, is that, as Mark Macdonald mentioned in March, is that through the review of the uh, Children's Scotland Act 1995, we've looked at providing a specific measure around domestic abuse for children and a specific offence within that. And the review process will allow those who have an interest in it and how we can shape that effectively to reflect our modern understanding of how it impacts on children and their welfare. We'll give way to Kezia Dugdale. Kezia Dugdale. And obviously the Cabinet Secretary's uh, remarks there are very much welcomed. Does he recognise, however, though, that as much as the procedure might work in practice very well, the reality is that we'll need appropriate resources to make sure it works for families at the same time? Uh, Secretary. Officer, I fully recognise that and uh, over the last three years the justice sector have been providing an extra £20 million to support some of the criminal aspects and the court aspects around domestic abuse to speed up the process in order to make sure course, uh, cases have been dealt with much more uh, quickly and we've made very significant progress in ensuring cases are being called at an earlier stage. So I do recognise the need to make sure there is sufficient resource but also the way in which the, and the member made reference, as others did, to the issue about how uh, the uh, child contact process can be used and manipulated by individuals in order to cause uh, greater harm to individuals who have experienced domestic abuse. And as part of our modernisation of family law, we've already given an undertaking to look at that specific measure to see where there are mechanisms and processes we can put in place in order to prevent that from taking place and for the system not to be abused. Officer, a number of members have also raised the issue about a, a publicity campaign around the, uh, the introduction of this bill. What I can uh, officer, assure members is that we will do exactly that, is that we will build in a publicity campaign to make sure there is greater awareness around the whole issue of domestic abuse and the new provisions within this bill. And I also think that John Finney uh, was on the money when he said about the police uh, and how the police will respond to this, because the way in which the police have responded to domestic violence now has changed dramatically, not just in the last 20 or 30 years, but in the last 10 years. We now have cases in court where one complaint results from one individual, results in three or four complaints from individuals because of the way in which the police now trace these issues back. And I'm confident, uh, with the right support and training, that Police Scotland and our officers, with their professionalism, will be able to see through the implementation of this piece of legislation. So, in drawing my remarks to uh, a close, 
Kezia Dugdale made a, a comment in the opening, in her opening, uh, uh, an opening comments, where she said that uh, domestic abuse will continue to uh, will continue to blight our society uh, while we continue to have inequality within our society. The reality is, presiding officer, the best domestic abuse is a product of social inequality and gender inequality within our society. Uh, the justice system can do so much in tackling this. And I am not uh, deluded to the point I think uh, that this legislation itself will end domestic abuse. But what I do believe it will do is it will give support to those women who have to suffer the misery of coercive and controlling behaviour over many, many years, and in some cases decades, to recognise that this parliament recognises their plight and that we are determined to do everything possible to bring the perpetrators of this type of misery to too many households in Scotland to account through our criminal justice system. And this bill will support us and assist us in achieving just that. Thank you very much. And that concludes our debate on stage one of the Domestic Abuse Scotland Bill. The next item of business is consideration of motion 7708 in the name of Derek Mackay on a financial resolution for the Domestic Abuse Scotland Bill. And I would call on Michael Matheson to move the motion. Moved. Thank you very much. We come now to decision time. There are two questions to be put. The first question is that motion 7905 in the name of Michael Matheson on stage one of the Domestic Abuse Scotland Bill be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The final question is that motion 7708 in the name of Derek Mackay on a financial resolution for the Domestic Abuse Scotland Bill be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And that concludes decision time. Thank you very much. I close the meeting. <laughs>